I'll have you turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the fourth chapter of the book of Proverbs and uh, was very specifically directed as to what to minister tonight by the Lord. And that's always good, right? Better than me just throwing a dart and seeing where it hits in the Bible. So So, uh, we're going to obey that. And uh, you understand this, everybody, that there are there are certain things, uh, a lot of things that we talk about. And uh, because there's a lot of areas that we need to have coverage on in our life, we, we need we don't need to leave certain things unattended in our life. You understand that. And so there's a whole lot that we would talk about. Do this, do this, do this. And uh, but yet there are what we could call root level. Root, yeah, I don't know if. Uh, I know they have computer programming language and that's one, you know, that's one term they might use root level. I might not know even what I'm talking about with that, but so disregard if you're a computer programmer, but but they have root level things and then things you build on. Right. And and the Bible certainly talks about things that are part of a foundation and then building upon that foundation. And so what I want to minister to you tonight is without a doubt, root level. Uh, foundational. But if the foundation is not in place, if the foundation's got cracks in it, if if things aren't right there, it's going to affect what's built on it. Amen. So uh, a verse over in the fourth chapter of the book of Proverbs. And uh, let me get there. It's in this 23rd verse. And I know you're familiar with the verse. It says this, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life that that's a verse it says keep your heart with all diligence uh, there's other translations that that instead of saying all diligence say above all else above all else in other words before you do anything else uh, if you're going to leave something undone don't leave this undone Guard, one translation says, guard the condition of your heart. Guard the condition of your heart. How many understand that in the natural you have a heart? Uh, If you're here tonight, I guarantee you do. In the natural, you have a heart. That's not uh, your natural heart, of course, is not what the Bible's speaking of when it when it's talking here, because you also have a spiritual heart. But in the natural, what is your heart? What, what is that? It is the core. Uh, could, could you say that it is headquarters of your physical body? And if the heart's not right, you best believe it's going to affect so many other things in your body. So uh, you understand that above all else, above your, before, you, before you work out them leg muscles, right? Before you, before you take care of other stuff, you can't just deal with your body from a clothing perspective. <laughs> because all that is is the outermost layer, but there's an innermost thing. You got to you got to take care of your heart, man. If they find that something's going on with your heart, they're on it really quick. Because that why? Because from it flows to the rest of your body, life, right? So too your spiritual heart. Well, what's your spiritual heart? You understand it's not, it's not your blood pump. Your spiritual heart is not your blood pump. I know people say you got to serve God with all your heart and they're pointing to their, uh, to their yeah. physical heart. Yeah. No, you can't serve God with a muscle. I'm sorry. You, can, you just can't serve God with a muscle. No. He's spirit. You have to serve him with spirit. No, your inner man. I'm having some trouble with the connection. Please try again. <laughs> you know, it, let me tell you something, honey. <laughs> You continue to interrupt me like that. I'm going to do away with you. (laughs) Did you all hear Siri? I don't know why she did that. But anyhow, I just know we're going to have a service now. (laughs) When things start preaching from the pulpit and I'm not even there. Glory to God. There are many voices in the world. None without significance. (laughs) What I was trying to say. Your spiritual heart is your inner man. And Jesus, in identifying our heart, he said this, out of your belly shall flow. It's in here. It's in here, your inner man. Uh, Peter calls it the hidden man of the heart. 
And if that's not in good condition, you can be doing some other things right. You can be making proper conf confessions, you understand, just by way of example. But if there's issues with your heart, we're going to have trouble. Now, I want to talk to you for a second about this word, issues. I was studying this verse, and I, I don't know a lot about the original languages of the Bible, a little bit. I did grow up going to Hebrew school because I was raised Jewish, you know, but uh, that doesn't mean I remember anything. Uh, matter of fact, I don't. But <laughs> usually when I'm studying, the Spirit will alert me. Check that out. Look at that. Just prompt me. You know what I mean? And he prompted me on this word, issues, the issues of life, because how many... Uh, could use some clarity along. What's that mean? Out of your heart, out of your inner man, flow the issues of life. Well, that word issues means this. It means outer limits, far reaches, boundaries. Do you get that? Outer limits, far reaches, boundaries. If we said we were going to go to the outer limits of a town... Where are you going? Yeah. You're going out to where maybe County Line Road, right? You're going out to the, to the county line or wherever that town changes from one town to, well, that's the boundaries. And so with that definition in mind, this verse teaches that we are to guard the condition of our heart because the condition of our heart sets the boundaries of our life. Now, what are boundaries? What are boundaries? Boundaries are how far you can go. We have a, a, a puppy dog right now and a, really another dog who just acts like it, but it's older. Um, so we have two dogs. The older dog, so we have an electric fence. Don't get mad at me for that. You know, <laughs> in Colorado, where I live, they think it's inhumane, but um, tough. <laughs> What's inhumane is, is, is anyhow, us dealing, trying to get the dog inside. So... <laughs> so the, the, that we have boundaries and they have a collar and that collar gives them a very humane beep. <laughs> and if the dog insists on ignoring the boundaries, we have a little dial where we can dial the boundaries back yep, yeah. Yeah. until he learns uh -huh. to stay within the boundaries. Yeah. The condition of your heart sets the boundaries of your life. The condition of your heart sets the boundaries of your life. It determines how far you're going to go. Why is it, friends, why is it that you can have two people sitting in the same service, hearing the same truths, getting the same word, have, both having the same opportunity, both having the same advantage, and one person does almost nothing with what they hear. In other words, their life just seems to be stagnant. They, they don't seem to make progress. It's just year after year, the same mess, the same troubles, the same situations, and doesn't get any better. And you have another person sitting in that same service, hearing that same word, and everything changes for them. I'll never forget when we were, I pastored for 11 years in uh, the Buffalo, New York area. And I remember one time we were teaching on really the believer's authority is what you would call it. And uh, we applied it one Sunday. I talked, it was probably the longest series of messages I had, can remember preaching. It was a dozen or so weeks. And uh, one Sunday morning, we, we were applying that to exercising authority over your family. I'm going to know you need to exercise authority over your family if you're in charge of your family and not just leave everything up to chance. Amen. You have to put some faith to things. You have to put some word to things and you have to take a stand with some things and sometimes tell other members of your family, particularly the younger ones, this is how it's going to be. and It's not going to be the way you want it to be. Amen. And so we were preaching along those lines and, and we made some comments and, and uh, what have you. And, uh, I got a couple emails from that one, from that sermon, you know. And uh, the one email said, uh, well, we're going to find us another church where the preacher has some compassion, I think is the word they use. Because <laughs> uh, we've had such trouble with our kids and for you to insinuate, I didn't insinuate it, I just said it. You know, but for, for, for you to insinuate that we could have done something about that, we could have 
prevented that. Well, that's, that's hurtful to us. And I didn't want them to leave. I wasn't trying to push them away. I didn't even know about their situation, but that's, that's, that was the fallout. But another family in the same service came to me. I mean, they can, they made a beeline for me after the service and I could see by the, the way they were lit up. I didn't need an usher. <laughs> And they said, our family will never be the same because of that. I said, if I had known, if I had known that years earlier, man, things could have been different, but we know it now. We're going to start doing it now. They both heard the same message. One went nowhere with it, actually went backwards. The other one, that message enlarged their boundaries. And so uh, how important is the condition of your heart. It determines how far you're going to go in the things of God. Amen. It should not be the case that only a select few people go far and everyone else just kind of stays in the mess, stays in the muck, stays there year after. No, that ought not be the case. That ought not be the case. You understand this friends. God has a plan for well, he's got a plan for the church as a whole, but yet he's got plans for you individually. That's right. And those plans, like everything else with God, they are exceedingly, abundantly, yeah. above yeah. all you can ask or think. Yeah. I'm not just talking to the people in here tonight that might have a call to ministry. Right. I'm talking about every per- God's plan for everyone. Yeah. Everyone is exceedingly abundantly if you if you will connect with that plan and if you will make movement with that plan and follow that plan he will blow you away as we say <laughs> he would he you you'll say i never i never could have dreamed this i never could have planned this that's for everybody that's for everybody i don't care who you are and i don't care how late you got to the party but God can have that kind of plan and he does have that kind of plan, but you can put limits based on the condition of your heart. You can set the boundaries way further in if your heart's not in good shape. The condition of your heart determines how far you'll go in life. And so really for most people, God's desires for them, God's plans for them is way out beyond what they ever realize. I don't know about you. I just don't want to get to heaven and find out this is what you left on the table. I don't. I don't want to leave anything on the table. I'd rather, I'd rather be in it all and, and mess it up a little bit and, and, you know, and not be perfect, but I'd rather be in it all than find out, man, you had, I had this for you. But we couldn't get there. And I had this for you. And we couldn't do that because you didn't keep your heart in right shape. And you brought in the boundaries and you set the limits. Amen. Say it with me. The condition of the heart sets the boundaries for my life. So we better talk about what is it that makes a heart a good heart? What is it that makes a heart a good heart? And what is it that makes a heart a a bad heart? Listen, there is no way. uh, I I, I don't care if all the gifts of the Spirit are operating. I cannot fully teach something like this out in the time we have. But how many know we can get the part we need for tonight? (laughs) Praise the Lord. But do you remember, so I'm not going to have you turn to a whole lot of places, but maybe a few. But do you remember what Jesus said uh, about Dr. Dufresne called it? the four types of dirt. You'll never forget that because I've never heard anybody use that phrase. It was just awesome. Amen. The four kinds of dirt. You know, the, you know, there was rocky ground. There was right. There was that thorny ground. What was the third one? Huh? Well, stony, rocky, the wayside ground. That was the first one. The wayside ground. I guess I should have studied, right? The wayside ground, the stony ground, the thorny ground, and the good ground. And Jesus, explaining that parable to his disciples, said the good ground, the seed that fell on good ground, are those who in an honest and good heart hear the word and bring forth fruit with patience. So you, those types of ground represent different conditions of 
your heart. That thorny ground is, is when people get occupied, overly occupied with the cares of this life. Remember, and they've heard the word, they may get excited about the word, but things come up and choke it out. And then they bring forth no fruit. That's another way of saying the boundaries got set. The, the boundaries got back way up. They go nowhere. The wayside ground, do you know that all four of those people, they all heard the word? They all heard. But only one brought forth fruit. The one, the one with a good heart. Heard the word and brings forth fruit with patience. So I, I do want to talk about just a couple things tonight. Like I said, you could, you could preach on this week after week after week and, and uh, take you quite a long time to exhaust the subject, but we're just going to hit a couple things and uh, then let you hear it from somewhere else, okay? The rest of it, or study it yourself. Praise God. And so why don't you turn to 2 Timothy? You doing okay? Yes. All righty. Every once in a while, smile just so I know you didn't check out. There's a couple things we want to avoid where the condition of our heart is concerned. And there's three of them in particular I want to talk about, but I don't know that I'll actually get to all three. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what they are. All right. The first one is no, we, you have to have no fake. There can be no fake. The second one is no false. And then the third would be no flesh. No fake, no false, no flesh. What did y'all think we were going to do, run around the room tonight? <laughs> there's some sermons where you run around the room when you hear them. And then there's other sermons that after you've done them, you'd be running then. Praise the Lord. Now, verse 5, 2 Timothy 1, chapter 5, Paul's writing to Timothy. And uh, he says, when I call to remembrance, notice this word, phrase, the unfeigned faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded in you also. He uses that phrase, unfeigned faith. Do you know what it means to have unfeigned faith? Um, to feign is to pretend. To feign something, it means to pretend. And he said, what you have is not pretend. But if there is not pretend faith, you understand there could be pretend faith. And let's just not limit this to the subject of faith, but let's just talk about your, your Christian life and, and use the word faith in that sense, your whole Christian faith, your whole Christian life. You know, you could be a pretender with the things of God. You know, some people are. That, that will keep you from going far. That will keep you from going far. So uh, we want not what's pretend, but we want what is genuine and we want what is real. And the reason we want that is because God wants that. And you might be able to get away with some stuff with people. But do you understand you can't fake it with God? You know, even us faith folks, we sometimes, you know, we sometimes throw around that phrase, you know, you got to fake it till you make it. I want you to know if you're faking it, you won't make it. <laughs> because even when we're walking by faith and calling things that be not as though they are that uh, as though they were, that is not fake. And if it is with you, uh, I pray that you move into the real. Because it's the real that gets results. It's the real that works. And the fake does not work, does not produce. Hallelujah. I don't like things that are fake. How about you? The other, the other day I went to get some cereal and we didn't have milk. And, and all we had in the refrigerator was almond milk. That is fake milk. 
That is fake milk. There's some folk, they put it, it looks just like the real. When you put it on the cereal, it looks just like, and there's people that eat cereal with that stuff. It is fake. You know, I listen, I, I was at a place and I wanted some milk and I didn't have any, but I had a bag of almonds and I tried to milk those things. I did, man. I tried in the bag. I tried out the bag, squeeze them. I couldn't get a drop out of that stuff. That's not milk. Almond milk is fake milk. I don't like fake stuff. I like the real. Amen. Uh, I don't like imitation. But you know, there's imitation Christians. Huh? You squeeze them, can't get a drop out of them, Pastor. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> we don't want imitation Christians. But what are, we, what are we talking about? What makes you fake or real? We're talking about the condition of your heart. We're talking about stuff on the inside being real. Just because a believer is a good actor does not mean they're a good Christian. You, and you can attend every service. You can give in every offering. You can volunteer for every opportunity. But there can still be a, a measure or a level of fake about it. Amen. You know, fake doesn't always mean evil. That almond milk, it's not evil. It's just not right. <laughs> it's just not real. God, where your life is concerned, where your relationship with him is concerned, God longs for reality. And the reason he longs for reality is reality breeds intimacy. Reality breeds intimacy. Oh, friends, there, there's believers and uh, there, there, there are believers that have no idea what it's like to experience true intimacy with God. You know what I mean by intimacy, everybody? It's a, it's a level of closeness. It's hard to quantify. It's hard to, it's hard to put, you know, when, when you first, when you first start dating somebody and, and, and you realize you're in love, I mean, how many know it's hard to put that in words sometimes, but, but there's, and not even talking about the phys, physical intimacy, just talking about relational intimacy. You spend hours on the phone together. What, you know what I mean? And, and uh, well, it's, it's your first love in some cases. How many know God's supposed to be our first love? But one of the, I'll tell you one of the things that, that just he, he couldn't stay silent about to the church. It was at the Laodicean church when he said, you guys have left your first love. You, you, I, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but don't be lukewarm about this thing. Don't be lukewarm about our relationship. Stay hot for me. Stay hot. He desires intimacy. He desires a relationship with you that is real. Where there's nothing. And, and the way to have that is to have nothing fake about you. Nothing fake about you. Because I'll just tell you. I thank God I have a wife who has not been fake with me. But if I sense that, it would make me want to back off. I'm not interested in fake. Everybody say reality. Intimacy. Glory. Are you being helped some tonight? Amen. People get so used to being fake that their whole life is a facade. You can fake, I tell you, you can fake it in the things of God. You can, you can fake it in the music. You can, you can have fake music going on up there, even though there's, there are real people playing real instruments, using real microphone, but the worship behind it can be fake. I don't, we don't see that here, thank God, but, but you see it some places. You can have fake music, fake work. You can have fake response. You could be the biggest responder in a church and it not be genuine because you can learn how to do it. Amen. That's right, preacher. That's right, preacher. That's right. It's like a parrot. <laughs> you can learn how to do it and then do it with your heart disconnected. And it's fake. It's fake. If you want to have a heart that where the boundaries are way out there where God's boundaries are and where God's plan is, there can be no fake. 
Oh, glory to God. God only receives what's genuine. He wants the real. He wants the raw. Amen. Yeah, we want to have excellence, but you know, you can have something that's so polished that you can't see the heart anymore. You can have something that's so programmed that the heart's been programmed out of it. And, and really, a lost person could do the same thing, and you wouldn't know the difference. Everybody say, give me the real. Give me the real. If you're going to, I don't care what kind of relationship you're talking about. If you're going to be real, you must be vulnerable. You must be tender. Hallelujah. You must expose your heart. Now, I won't ask for testimonies here, but I'll just ask you this. Is anybody here, you've ever been in some kind of relationship and your heart got hurt? <laughs> and what did you do? What did you do? You constructed a wall in record time. I'm not talking about, a well, a border wall. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Build that wall. Build that wall. You constructed a border wall for what purpose? So that ain't nobody ever going to hurt me again. And you put that wall up around your heart and uh, you weaponized it like in a good superhero movie. You know, when they, <laughs> you remember the Indiana Jones movies when, when they say, you know, you had to walk here and then walk here. And if you don't, stuff comes flying out the wall to, to cut you to pieces. And if anybody gets close to you and tries to, and tries to get close to you and get intimate and get real, <sighs> <laughs> they run into your wall. You're using it as a shield, but it ends up being a sword. Now you might, you might say, what, ha what authority do you have to talk about these things? Well, you're looking at a professional faker, former, former professional <laughs> faker. I just tell you this, growing up, not knowing the Lord, you can really be a mess. Anybody, anybody had that? You can be a big old mess. And some folk hide it, and some folk don't hide it. But uh, I, I could have been, you know, you look in the dictionary and look up the word insecurity, they could have put my picture there, and I would have put my hand over my face. I mean, you know, I was, I was insecurity personified growing up. I, I just, the other day, must have been a week or two, we were with a friend of mine and, and I was, he was asking me about a picture or something. So I'm scrolling through and I, sh I flashed him a picture of me in high school. And he said, oh my God, that's not you. I said, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. I was so insecure as a teenager, you could see it on me. And, and I'll never forget, I'd be laying there in, in bed. We had a, a mirror built into the door of our closet in the bedroom my brother and I shared. And I'd just be laying there on bed and I'd look in the mirror and I'd hear voices. And those voices would say, you are so ugly. And I'd just repeat them to myself. Oh, man, I'm so ugly. You'll never get a date. I'll never get a date. You just, I mean, anything that that voice would tell me, I'd believe it because I didn't know any different. Ain't nobody was telling me different. And uh, so I'm just listening to those voices. And I got to and I'd walk around all stooped over like this. And, um, you know, I, I just hid behind. So I would build walls and wouldn't let anybody in. I mean, I, I, I'd always be trying to impress people. And, and, uh, and, you know, any joke you tell, I'd rehearsed it several times. Make sure. It, come on now. Everything was preconceived. Everything was structured so that you ain't getting in because I could not handle the reject rejection. Right, right, right. Just, it's just fake. Yeah, that's good. And it wasn't no reason for it. I got married, started listening to my wife. She told me I was good looking. She told me, she told me the truth. But ain't, <laughs> what? But ain't nobody was telling me that. So I had to, I had to start hearing the right voices. But you, you just, you're going to have to tear that wall down. You're going to have to get real with God. You're going to have to be just 
He sees it all. He knows it all. All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You're just going to have to expose yourself before God and be real and you will not be rejected. Jesus said, he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. He will receive you and he will build into you what you, what you never thought could be there. But you, gotta, you can have no fake, no fake. And then you can have no false. Secondly, what's the difference between fake and false? Well, you know, to, 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 when you're fake, you can do all of the right things and just not have your heart connected. Now, when you're false, you may show up on Sunday, but as soon as you leave the church, you start compromising and you know it. Don't make me come back there. Come on now. <laughs> false. What's the opposite of False. You want to look at a verse here in Hebrews chapter 10 with me? Well, nobody said yes, but go to Hebrews chapter 10. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. Listen, you understand ain't nobody mad at you tonight. Nobody's fussing at you tonight. We want, we want you to be able to go the distance of God's plan for you. We want you to be able to experience the exceedingly abundantly above. We don't want any boundaries that you've set in place. We want those removed. We're trying to help you. And Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 says, let us draw near with what? A true heart. A true heart in full assurance of faith. Glory. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. What's full assurance of faith mean? It means there's no doubting. Do you know you can't have full assurance of faith without a true heart? A heart with no compromise? No compromise, no compromise. You know, the enemy really is okay with your faith life being somewhat real, as long as on the deepest level, it's not. And do you know why? Because when life hits the fan, as we say, you automatically have to go to that deepest level. And as long as that's not real, he knows you're sunk. It's got to be real all the way, real all the way. You can't have compartments of your life that are closed off to God. And, 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 and come on, and what lunacy to think he doesn't see? What, what, what stupidity to think he doesn't know? He knows it. You know he knows it. You can't have it tonight. We open up those doors. We open up that door to him. Praise the Lord. You cannot compromise. Your faith must be pure. I tell you, when I when I got saved in the 1980s, it was I don't know how I knew it. I came out of uh, I came out of, uh, you know, I was a jazz musician. I had been in bars since I was 15 years old. I did all my drinking before I was legally old enough. <laughs> you know what I mean? And uh, when I got saved, nobody told me now we don't drink. It was obvious that we didn't drink. I wouldn't. Nobody that I knew who called themselves a Christian would even think right. Come on. of compromising in that way. Right. Now it's like, who knows? I mean, and, and then folk will just, just flat put it on social media, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, it's not, like it's nothing, it's no deal. Right. Well, can't we just drink a little wine? Well, what? You can drink a li- you can drink wine, but you can't drink the world's wine and God's wine. You're going to have to decide which kind you want. You're going to have to Now you need something. <laughs> you need something. <laughs> You're going to have to decide which kind you want because it, No, no, you can't you can't have a compromised heart. I want to I want let's just get one more scripture in at least. Psalm 51 if you would. Praise the Lord. Wow, 
while you turn and say it with me. No fake, no, fake. no, false. no false, just real, just real. real before God. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, hallelujah. Now, in the 51st Psalm, this is a, this is a really, I'll use that word raw, portion of Scripture. David had, had done messed up real bad. Really had allowed himself to get deceived. You probably have heard the story of him with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of of one of his mighty men of valor named Uriah. And while they were out to battle, while his men were out to battle fighting for the kingdom, he happens to see Bathsheba and uh, determines that she, she's, she's just too fine to leave alone, you know? And, and uh, whatever thought process he took, he took those thoughts and he, he turned those thoughts over, ends up calling her to the to the palace and violates her, gets her pregnant. And uh, so instead of repenting at that point, he decides, well, we'll fix this. And the way he fixes it, long story short, really has Uriah killed, really has her husband killed. And so now it all looks like, well, okay, there, there's no issue. We took care of it. We took care of it. The only thing is the prophet Nathan comes in and calls him out. He said, you did this. And David instantly repents. Boom. Well, I mean, he, he came to him. So his eyes were opened. He came to himself. He saw what he had done. And he got before God and he got so genuine and he got so real that God was able to do for him what is, is not able to happen with everybody. And that is, he was able to recover a portion, at least, of his influence. Listen, there's been people that have fallen and they're done. But something, something about David allowed him to be restored. Now, what, what's best? Well, what's best is to not do what he did. Right. That's what's best. And listen, there's power for us to never do that. There's grace in our lives. We, I mean, we're, we better than him, just in the sense that 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 uh, we're indwelt by the spirit. The spirit was on him as king, but we're indwelt by the spirit. We have such advantage to, to be able to live clean and live right. But I want you to see one thing when David, this psalm is David's psalm of repentance where he got real with God. And I want to just point out to me what is probably the highlight of the psalm. Praise the Lord. See, she hasn't interrupted me again since I fussed at her. You, you got you to gotta lay it down, lay, lay it straight for her. <laughs> he says, uh, well, starting in verse three, he said, I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned. And done this evil in your sight. He's agreeing with God about it, isn't he? That you might be justified when you speak and be clear when you judge. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity. In sin did my mother conceive me. Look at verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. Man, something about that just jumps out at me. You desire truth on the inside. You desire, it, it, you got to be real. You got to be true, not false. You cannot live a lie. If you live a lie, you're setting yourself up to be deceived. Amen. Now, why am I, why am I preaching that? Well, <clears throat> number one, God told me to. Number two, it just seems to me, and I'm not, I'm not pointing nobody out. This is, this is you and God here tonight, but it seemed to me like there are folk who probably need to make some adjustments. Now, you understand that making adjustments is not a bad thing. I do it every time I drive. It'd be nice if you could just point your steering wheel in the direction you're going and never touch that steering wheel again. But I make adjustments all the time. I make an adjustment here, make an adjustment there. And then sometimes, sometimes I, uh, well, like for today example, because I'm not here all the time and, the, and they change the names of the streets 
at some streets, then this side is this street and this side is that street. And I blew past where I was supposed to go. So I made a bigger adjustment called a U-turn. Yep. <laughs> yep. A U-turn's not a negative thing. I could have kept going the wrong way and get further, fr- further and further and further from my destination. But I made that U-turn and we got right. And we got back on course. Amen. Lost a little time, but amen. There, there's always adjustments. There's always course corrections. And sometimes there's U-turns. But we don't want you to live in compromise and miss out on what God has for you. Because a little bit off course, you keep going that way, years down the road, you'll end up so far off from what God called you to do. From what God has to. Y'all hearing me tonight? In your heart tonight, glory to God. You know, you, we need to make adjustments, some of us. Now, if, God, if, if you know you're on course, if you know you're real, but everybody can respond to the word. How many, I don't know about you, just me preaching this and me studying this, it got me, it got me closer to it than I was, right? The word help anybody because I don't care who you are, how long you've been in the things of God, you can get to where things are not 100% real and, and you just start faking it a little bit. And having your heart disconnect, that just requires an adjustment. But we're going to make the adjustment. And and if you need a course correction, you're going to make that course correction between you and God tonight. And if you need a U-turn, huh? If you need to turn it around and maybe, maybe it's, I don't know, it could be a relationship with somebody that really is not right. Or maybe it could have been right, but the way it's going is not right. I hope you're listening tonight. And you need to make a U-turn. What's that mean? Go back. Go away from that. Go away from that. Adjustments. Course corrections. U-turns. If you need to do that, do that. And God, if you're real, he'll see it. He'll accept it. He'll receive it. Won't hold it over your head. Won't beat you up with it. And we'll go down the road, glory to God, on the right course, with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, receiving all that he's got for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Where's Brother Tony? Is he here or not here? He's there? Oh, yeah, I got you. He was playing some video games back there. I just saw him. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Here's what we're going to do, folks. Listen, is it okay? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to sing a little song. Is that all right? And uh, just in that time, you and God just get together. Let him deal with you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Sacrifice before you today. I'm hungry for more of your wonderful things. Take my life, every part, as I bring you my heart. I bring you my heart. Ready for change, my sacrifice before you today. I'm hungry for more of your wonderful things. Take my life, every part, as I bring you my. satisfied with more of the same 
I'm just not willing to leave like I came I've seen your glory and I've got to have more That's what my heart longs for I bring you my heart Ready for change My sacrifice Before you today I'm hungry for more of your wonderful thing. Take my life, every part, as I bring you my heart. Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We worship you. I bring you my heart, ready for change, my sacrifice. For you today, I'm hungry for more of your wonderful things. Take my life, every part, as I bring you my heart. I bring you my heart, ready for change. My sacrifice before you today. I'm hungry for more of your wonderful things. Take my life, every part. Take my life, take my life, every part. Take my life, every part, as I bring you my heart.